All right, so you're setting up Proxmox for the first time, right? And then you hit this thing called Secure Boot, and you think, well, I'm, it's got to be on, right? Right. It sounds important. Oh, yeah. But then you go online, yeah. and you see all these people talking about turning it off, yeah. especially like people with home labs yeah. and beginners, mm -hmm. and you're thinking, yeah. wait a minute, what's going on here? Yeah, that tracks. Why are so many Proxmox users disabling Secure Boot? Yeah. It's a great question. That's what we're diving deep into today. Okay. And we've got a really interesting conversation from the Prosbox community to help us figure this out. Sounds good. So in this deep dive, we're going to go through what Secure Boot is, yeah. why it seems to be ca causing headaches for some Proxmox users, why? what the community thinks about it, okay. whether it's actually safe to turn it off, right. <laughs> and even how to do it. Right. We want to give you all the info so you can make the best choice for your Proxmox system. Yeah, I think that's key, right? To make sure you're making an informed decision based on your needs. Exactly. Your security needs, your hardware needs. Yeah, feeling like you need a degree in computer science. Yeah, right? none of that. <laughs> We're going to try to keep it no, as yeah, straightforward as possible. All right, so let's start with the basics. Okay. What exactly is Secure Boot? So Secure Boot... It sounds so official. It's, it sounds very important, and it's designed to be important. Right. What it is, it's a security protocol, okay? Mm -hmm. And it operates at the firmware level. Okay. So that means it's part of your UAFI. UFI. Which is the modern interface. Okay. You know, it's basically replaced the traditional BIOS on most computers these days. Right. The main idea... Okay, the fundamental idea behind Secure Boot mm. is to make sure that only boot code that has been digitally signed okay. and therefore trusted can actually run when you power in your system. So there's like a digital signature? Yes, a digital signature. Okay, so like when my computer starts up, Secure Boot is like checking IDs. Yeah, like a bouncer at the door yeah. checking to see if you're on the list. Gotcha. So it's making sure that things like your operating system loader, right? Mm -hmm. The very first piece of software that runs yeah. has a valid digital signature okay. from a recognized authority. You know, Like who are these authorities? Usually it's going to be like your hardware manufacturer Got or operating system vendor. Gotcha. But the key is if that signature isn't there, yeah. If it's not recognized, mm. Secure Boot steps in mm -hmm. and it's like, nope, you're not coming in. Right. I don't trust you. So this makes a lot of sense in a corporate environment. Right. You know, they've got servers with sensitive information. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. In enterprise environments, this is really key, right? Yeah. Where you absolutely have to make sure that no. everything that boots up is legitimate. It's yeah. trusted. Totally. You don't want any malware getting in there right. and messing things up. Makes perfect sense. Right. But why is it yeah. that for a lot of home server users, yeah. and especially folks who are using Proxmox, yeah. secure boot seems to be more of a problem than a solution? Yeah. And I think yeah. where's the disconnect? Yeah. You know, it's a good question. And I think the disconnect often comes in when you're trying to add things to your system okay. that aren't part of that initial chain of trust. Okay. So, for example, yeah. you know, if you're trying to install a third party graphics card mm -hmm. like uh, a dedicated nvidia gpu yeah yeah which is super common in like the proxmox community especially for like pass through and stuff yeah for pass through or even just for hardware acceleration right, right. making things run smoother mm -hmm. or you're trying to run certain types of software yeah that might rely on you know specific kernel modules okay that maybe aren't signed okay. that's when you start running into problems so this is the classic driver issue right yeah driver issues are the main about definitely it. pain point yeah yeah the source material mentions you know, NVIDIA cards specifically. Yeah, they talk about a Quadro P400. The Quadro P400, yeah. So what's going on there? What's the conflict with Secure Boot? So the problem is, for Secure Boot to allow those drivers to load, those drivers need to be signed too. Oh, so even the drivers need to be signed? Yes, the drivers also need a digital signature. Gotcha. And if NVIDIA hasn't signed those drivers in a way that your UEFI trusts, then Secure Boot's going to step in and say, nope. Right. Not happening. So it's not as simple as just downloading the driver from NVIDIA's website I'll and change. installing it. No. Secure Boot might just block it. The Secure Boot will be like, I don't know who you are. Yeah, get out of here. So what do you do in that situation? So this is where things get tricky. Yeah, okay. If you want to use those unsigned drivers with Secure Boot enabled, yeah. you basically have to dive into the world of 
self-signing. Oh, wow. Kernel modules. Self-signing kernel modules. And this typically involves using something called DKMS. DKMS. Dynamic kernel module support. What does that do? So basically, think of it as a way for your operating system to manage these, like, out of tree kernel modules. Okay. Right. Things that aren't officially part of the kernel. Yeah. But to get it to work with secure boot. Right. You then have to generate your own cryptographic signing keys. Oh boy. You have to configure your system to use them. Yeah. And then you have to tell your UAFI firmware, hey, trust these keys. Right. It's basically like you're creating your own little notary stamp. Yeah. For your software. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that sounds pretty complicated. Yeah. It's not the simplest process. Especially if you're just trying to set up a home server. Right. I mean, if you're just getting started with Proxmox. Yeah. And you're not super comfortable with, like, the Linux kernel and cryptography. Yeah. yeah. And messing around with UEFI settings. Yeah. It can be a bit daunting, to say the least. And there's this quote from the Proxmox forums that I really liked. Um, someone said... I'm not at that level yet to be able to understand signing kernel modules and being able to troubleshoot any problems I have with that. Right. So should I disable secure boot or just run Jellyfin in a VM and avoid the hassle? Yeah, that's a great quote. And your response was, yeah, that tracks. Yeah, that tracks. Why did that resonate so much? I think it just perfectly sums up the dilemma that so many users are facing. Yeah. Like this person just wants to run Jellyfin, mm. which can really benefit from direct GPU access. Right. But Secure Boot is throwing up this roadblock yeah. that requires all this technical knowledge that maybe they don't have yet. Right. And so they're like, is it worth it? Right. Is the security benefit worth all this extra hassle? Yeah. Or can I just, you know, disable it or work around it somehow? So given all this, what's the general feeling in the Proxmox community? So if you look at how people are actually using Proxmox, yeah. the overwhelming trend is that most users just disable Secure Boot. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. You go on the Proxmox forums, you read the community discussions, mm -hmm. disabling Secure Boot comes up time and time again as the solution to these kinds of problems. That's so fascinating. And the source material we have here, you know, they pull out some pretty direct opinions. Yeah. What were some of those? Like one user just straight up said, Secure Boot is an enterprise feature that makes life difficult. Wow. Yeah. I mean, they didn't mince words. No, they didn't. And I think that reflects a common sentiment, mm -hmm. you know, especially among home lab users and people who are using Proxmox for personal projects. Yeah. They see Secure Boot as adding complexity. Right. Without a clear benefit. Right. Because the security risks for a home server are different. Right. Exactly. It's not the same as a corporate server. Yeah. If your server is behind your router. Right. At home. Yeah. The security threats are different. Total. Than if you're running a public facing corporate server. There was another quote that was pretty strong, too. Yeah. What was that one? Someone said, um, it causes all sorts of problems and solves none. Oh, yeah. Turns out most secure boot implementations have been insecure for years now. That's a spicy take. It is. But it reflects the frustration that a lot of users feel. Yeah. You know, they run into these weird issues. Right. And they're not seeing a clear security benefit. Right. So they're like, what's the point? Yeah. And, you know, it's worth mentioning. Yeah. The source material even talks about issues with running Proxmox VMs with Secure Boot enabled. Oh, wow. Like you can get these quirky UAFI behaviors. Really? Inside the VMs. Mm. And some users have even reverted to using MBR. Wow. Instead of UAFI. Just to avoid the issue. Just to avoid the headaches. That's wild. Yeah, it's kind of ironic, right? Yeah. This security feature designed to make things more secure mm -hmm. is actually causing all these problems in right. a virtualized environment. So we've established that secure boot can be a pain. Yes. The community seems to lean towards disabling it. But the big question for our listener is, is it actually safe to disable it? Right. You know, it's got secure in the name. Yeah. So I can imagine some people are a little nervous about turning it off. I totally get that, yeah. So what's the answer? Well, the answer, like most things in tech, is it depends. Of course it depends. It depends on your setup. Okay. What are you using your Proxmox server for? Right. So, for example, yeah. if you're running, like, a multi-user production server. Okay. That's directly connected to the internet. Yeah and it's handling sensitive data, uh -huh. then taking the time yeah. to figure out secure boot yeah. and configure it properly right. could be worth it. 
Okay. In that kind of environment, you know, you want all the security you can get. You need defense in depth. Defense in depth, yeah. Yeah. And secure boot can be one layer of that defense. Makes sense. Right. But what about the majority of our listeners who are probably yeah. running home labs, experimenting with VMs, mm -hmm. or maybe just trying to get Plex to use their GPU for transcoding? Right, right. What about them? So in those more common scenarios, the source material is pretty clear. Okay. Disabling secure boot is usually the easier path. Okay. You're prioritizing functionality and ease of use mm. over a security measure that might not offer a huge benefit right. in your specific context. Gotcha. Compared to the complexity it adds. And the source also points out yeah. that disabling secure boot doesn't mean your system is suddenly wide open. Right. It's not like you're throwing all security out the window. Oh, yeah. It's just one layer. Exactly. You still have your firewall. Right. You still have the security features in your operating system. Yeah. You know, your applications, your VMs. Mm -hmm. Disabling secure boot is just removing one specific layer. Right. And it's not a permanent decision, is it? No, not at all. If someone disables it now, yeah. but later on they decide they want to revisit it, and they can just uh, re-enable it. Yeah, you can always go back and enable it. Gotcha. It's totally reversible. Okay, that's good to know. So you're not making a permanent commitment. So for our listeners who are ready to disable secure boot, okay. how do they actually do it? All right, so the good news is it's usually pretty straightforward. <sighs> the exact steps might be a little different depending on your motherboard. Right. But the basic idea is you need to access your BIOS or UV5 settings. Right. And you do that during boot. Yeah. So when you first turn on your computer, okay. keep an eye out for a message on the screen mm -hmm. that tells you which key to press okay. to enter setup. Gotcha. It's often the delete key or ESC or maybe one of the function keys like sure. F2. Yeah. And you usually have to press it repeatedly Yeah. while the computer is starting up. Okay. So you're in the BIOS. You're in the BIOS. What are you looking for? So you're going to navigate through the menus. Okay. And again, the layout will depend on your motherboard. But look for sections that are related to boot, security, or maybe authentication. Okay. And somewhere in one of those sections, you should find an option for a secure boot. Secure boot. And you just want to change that to disabled. Okay. So find secure boot. Yep. Change it to disabled. That's it. Save your changes. Save and exit. Reboot. Reboot. And you're good to go. And that's it. And the source also mentions that it's even simpler for Proxmox VMs. Yeah, so if you've enabled Secure Boot for a VM in Proxbox mm -hmm. and it's causing issues, yeah. you can actually adjust it directly in the VM's configuration. Oh, really? Yeah, you go to the Proxmox web interface, okay. select the VM, yeah. go to its hardware settings, okay. and then find the entry for the VM's BIOS. Mm -hmm. It'll probably say something like CBIOS or OVMF, UEFI. Right. And within those settings, there's usually an option to configure the UEFI. Gotcha. That includes disabling secure boot. Okay, that's super helpful. Yeah. All right, so let's recap. What are the key takeaways from this deep dive into secure boot and Proxmox? So the main takeaway is that while secure boot is great in theory, yeah, especially for enterprise environments, mm -hmm. in practice, it can be a real headache for Proxmox users. Especially home users. Especially home users and beginners. And what are the main reasons why people are disabling it? Well, we talked about the driver issues, right. especially with NVIDIA graphics cards. Yeah. And then there are the weird UAFI boot problems that can sometimes pop up. Right. And then the fact that a lot of people just aren't ready to deal with the complexity of signing kernel modules. Yeah, makes sense. So for beginners. Yeah. For anyone running Proxmox in a her lab setting, mm -hmm. turning off secure boot is often the best way to go. It's the easiest way to get things up and running yes. without pulling your hair out. And you can always turn it back on later. Right, exactly. Yeah. So going back to our initial question, yeah. if you're setting up Proxmox and you're running into secure boot issues, yeah. based on what we've seen from the Proxmox community, mm -hmm. disabling it is often the recommended first step. Absolutely. It makes things a lot simpler. It does. And lets you focus on actually using Proxmox. Yeah, getting things done. And that brings us to our final thought. Okay, shoot. Considering how much the Proxmox community values practicality, mm. what other security features yeah. might have similar workarounds? That's a good question. Or be less critical than they seem I like that. For home lab setups. Yeah. What other things are we taking for granted? Exactly. That maybe that. we don't need to worry about so much. That's something to think about. It is. It is. As you continue your Proxmox journey. Keep experimenting. 
Thanks for joining us for this deep dive into Secure Boot. It was my pleasure. Hopefully this has given you some guidance yeah. and helped you make an informed decision. Definitely. Keep exploring, keep learning, mm -hmm. and we'll catch you next time for another deep dive. Sounds good.